The space exploration uh, effort and internationally, of course, has a prehistory going back to uh, Robert Goddard and all of those folks uh, early, and early pioneers and scientists. But the modern space age really began in 1957 with the launch of Sputnik. Sputnik was the first man-made object ever uh, launched into space. Of course, it was done by the, uh, the USSR. They successfully uh, launched it. It was, it was quite traumatic, uh, quite a traumatic event geopolitically, uh, quite impactful on the, uh, the US. Uh, and it put a scare into Americans because uh, it wasn't ours. It belonged to the Soviets, and they were overflying the U.S. Uh, and that reality was driven home to us by the fact that we could tune to the right frequency uh, and listen. If you uh, had your headphones on at the time and were tuned to the right frequency with a sufficient antenna. This was the first signal from outer space. Uh, and it just drove home the fact that the Soviets were ahead of us in space, that they could fly over uh, and watch, uh, or not watch, but at least uh, be overfly the US. And the idea was, the, the fear was, if they could do that with a satellite, they could certainly maybe do that with a, with a reconnaissance mission or even with a nuclear weapon. So it really uh, launched the space age and led, NASA, uh, led Congress to pass the National Aeronautics and Space Act, which created NASA. And so the, uh, the space race was on. Uh, so the Soviets continued to uh, advance their, uh, their leadership. After launching a few more Sputnik satellites and a couple of dogs, uh, Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space. On April 12, 1961, uh, he took off from Baikonur Cosmodrome and uh, accomplished a 108-minute mission which completely orbited the Earth and came back down and landed in a, a wheat field uh, in Thanks Russia and was greeted by uh, a farmer who reportedly said, did you? like, come from outer space? And he said, why, yes, I did. And uh, he was the first one to have done so. Uh, Gagarin remains quite a hero in the space community, and uh, every April 12th is celebrated internationally by what's called Yuri's Night. Uh, and people around the world will, will celebrate his, uh, uh, his accomplishment. It's uh, kind of the ultimate nerd party for, uh, for space enthusiasts. Uh, but at the time, it showed how far ahead the USSR was uh, of the US in space. And, uh, a month later, we launched Alan Shepard, the first American space on a, in space on a Mercury Redstone capsule. This was a suborbital flight. It went into space, as space is defined, uh, but it was a, flew a parabolic arc and landed a, a few hundred miles downrange. Uh, a signal accomplishment, but we're still behind the Russians in the race for space. Nevertheless, on the strength of that single suborbital mission, John F. Kennedy went before a joint session of Congress and announced that the United States would commit to a lunar landing before this decade is out. I, I can't begin to express to you uh, how, I, how bold a step that seems, right? We had no idea how we were gonna do this. Uh, we were behind the Soviet Union. All we had accomplished is one suborbital flight, and yet Kennedy committed us to going to the moon. It came as kind of a shock to NASA leadership. We were providing the administration with options and uh, things we might do. Uh, but his science advisor uh, and him got together and decided, look, we need something that will be sufficiently dramatic and leapfrog uh, the Soviet uh, efforts in space, but be sufficiently near term that we could accomplish it within this decade time frame as a matter of, of, uh, uh, of having the geopolitical world take us seriously. And so uh, it was really a, a remarkable, uh, remarkable pronouncement for him to make. Uh, then uh, we flew John Glenn's successful orbital flight and then JFK went to Rice University uh, and gave this historic speech. I think it was one of the most famous presidential speeches uh, of all time. ...that space can be explored and mastered without feeding the fires of war, without repeating the mistakes that man has made in extending his writ around this globe of ours. There is no strife, no prejudice, no national conflict in outer space as yet. Its hazards are hostile to us all. Its conquest deserves the best of all mankind. And its opportunity for peaceful cooperation may never come again. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon.
We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. A really remarkable it is speech. Um, reasons, one of the most famous, I think, ever, uh, uh, ever made. Incidentally, that, that clap line that he got, why does Rice play Texas? That was Kennedy's own insertion. He had the speech written for him, and he, of course, had been all the previous edits of it. But before, he, when he got into this venue, this very hot uh, Texas, uh, uh, Rice, Texas Stadium, uh, he penned that in himself uh, just before this, giving the speech, and it, and it really drew uh, quite a reaction from the, uh, from the crowd. But again, an ambitious goal uh, with our national reputation now on the line before we even had a plan that we could show the president about how we were actually going to do it. He stepped out and committed it to do it. Uh, but even before we had a plan, we did have a few things going for us. We had these guys on the left, the Mercury 7. Uh, how many of you saw the movie The Right Stuff? I uh, highly recommend it. Terrific, uh, uh, terrific film. Uh, but we had those folks, fearless uh, explorers, who uh, were ready to take uh, some risks and put their, uh, their lives on the line. Uh, we also had these gentlemen on the left, Werner von Braun and his Germans, uh, who we brought over after World War II under uh, Project Paperclip. Uh, if you have not read Ann Applebaum's book, Project Paperclip, uh, it's, I highly recommend it. It talks about that era, the folks that we brought over, the moral ambiguity involved in doing so. It, it's really a, a, a good read. But we had uh, Werner von Braun and his, uh, his Germans at Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh, but these were actually just the most, the most famous guys. We actually had a few other, uh, a few other tools in our pocket. Uh, we had NACA. Uh, NASA was created in 1958, but it was not created out of whole cloth. Uh, it was created using assets from the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, which was formed in 1915 with uh, one of the Wright brothers as its chair. Uh, and it was created by Congress because they saw how Europe was getting ahead of us in aviation. And it's the NACA that really advanced aviation uh, in this country and really allowed us to achieve uh, victory in the air in World War II. Uh, NACA got absorbed by NASA and we formed the NASA Space Task Group at Langley, Virginia in, uh, in 1958 headed by Dr. Robert Gilruth, who became the first director of Johnson Space Center and ran the Space Center during the uh, Apollo era. Then we had Maxime Figet, uh, the son of uh, uh, doctors in what was then British Honduras, now Belize. Uh, he came to this country and uh, went to the University of San Francisco and got interested in aeronautical engineering. Um, Max Figet was the lead designer on every U.S. manned spacecraft, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Space Shuttle Orbiter. Uh, you've probably heard this, the expression, what would Jesus do? Uh, Ralph Rowe, who's the current chief engineer of NASA, when he runs into a problem, it's, what would Max do? Uh, he was that kind of a guy and, and a brilliant uh, designer for a generation. Uh, Christopher Columbus Kraft, uh, who had really invented the flight control system for NASA. If you saw any of the space movies like Apollo 13 or what have you, that control room concept with uh, different technical stations backed up by engineers in a back room all reporting to a flight director, uh, that, was, that was Chris Kraft. Uh, if you saw the movie, Paul Thurston, did you see that movie? Uh, Gene Kranz in the white vest, right? Uh, Chris was red, Gene was white, and my old boss, John Hodge, was blue. Uh, and every flight director after that has had a color uh, associated with them uh, as part of their team building uh, activities. We have these three gents uh, who are really instrumental in making the space program go on the U.S. side. Uh, and then, of course, we had this fellow, uh, John C. Humboldt. Uh, as I mentioned, when uh, Kennedy made his commitment, we didn't quite have a plan for how we were going to pull this off. The idea was we had, we had uh, Von Braun's idea for a Saturn V rocket. Um, but the, the thought was we would launch this thing, and then we would have a single spacecraft that would fly to the moon, land on the moon, take off from the moon, and fly back to Earth. Uh, Hubert looked at the physics of that and said, mm, no, 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 no. Uh, and he was in the minority opinion at that time, so he went outside the chain of command, wrote a letter to the incoming uh, boss, the head of the, the Apollo program, Robert Siemens, uh, and said, look, do we want to go to the moon or not? If you're going to go to the moon, you've got to do this. You've got to do lunar orbit rendezvous, and you have to have uh, separate vehicles because you, you can't take one vehicle and land on the moon and take off from the moon. The, the mass uh, in the equation simply doesn't work. And so he designed, essentially, the mission concept, orbiting the Earth, uh, uh, pulling the, 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 the LEM and the CSM and the 
uh, service modules we'll talk about in a minute, send those to the moon, land with a separate vehicle, take off, rendezvous around the lunar orbit, and come back. And it was going to take that set of vehicles to pull it off. And he was able to demonstrate with his uh, uh, slide rule and his chalkboard that that really is the way it had to be done. Uh, and so he, uh, uh, he was the guy that, uh, that pulled that off and, and really developed the Apollo uh, lunar exploration mission concept, mission architecture. <coughs> Uh, and so while we were then figuring out how we were going to build the pieces of Apollo, put them together, we also had some things we needed to learn about spaceflight. Because all we'd done now, to this point, is Mercury. We had, we had, right, we had flown and we'd orbited the Earth, we'd done some initial experiments with, uh, uh, with, with how the human behaves in space, what kind of adaptation procedures were required. But we needed to learn a whole lot about uh, uh, spacewalks, extravehicular activity. We needed to learn rendezvous and docking. That was the big thing. You've got a spacecraft in orbit. You're going to launch another one. You've got to go find it. You've got to be able to line up with it. You've got to be able to dock with it. You've got to be able to control those spacecraft. And you've got to be able to separate and come back down. That's just one of a thousand things we had to learn to do. Ten Gemini missions while we were building Apollo uh, gave us the operational experience uh, to be able to, to conduct those kinds of missions. Uh, one of those key missions was Gemini 8, which is the mission on which Neil Armstrong earned his chit to uh, be the, the first guy on the moon. In Gemini 8, as, again, part of this rendezvous docking thing, we launched an unmanned Agena spacecraft. It was already in orbit. Then we launched the, uh, uh, the Gemini 8 uh, capsule, uh, Gemini, the twins, because there's, there's two astronauts, with Armstrong and, uh, and Dave Scott. They successfully accomplished that mission. They located the Agena. They maneuvered to it. They docked with it. Uh, they conducted a set of maneuvers. Uh, but before they could pull away, there was a failure on the Agena spacecraft in its attitude control system. And it, it sent the entire spacecraft uh, tumbling essentially out of control. Uh, so they had to do an emergency undock, but the forces from the Gemini spacecraft were already introduced into the Gemini spacecraft. And so the Gemini spacecraft is now unstable in three directions, roll, pitch, and yaw. All, uh, all three axes were unstable. And the crew was, uh, uh, was in severe jeopardy at that point. Not only can you not land in that uh, attitude uh, situation, uh, but the forces on the, on the astronauts were giving them limited time before they would just pass out. Uh, and so Armstrong, uh, being the guy that he is, used, uh, we had two rings of reentry control thruster, thrusters to, to control the descent through the atmosphere on the Gemini spacecraft. He took one of those uh, and he fired those uh, reentry control boosters, those little rockets, uh, in, in the right order to dampen out the instability in each one of these axes and went from a three-axis out-of-control tumbling situation to a flying right uh, configuration. Then they were able to land, uh, come back into the atmosphere and land in the ocean. Uh, and they wanted this picture with the three recovery guys because to add insult to injury, when they landed, there were 15-foot swells, seas, uh, that they, uh, uh, so their recovery from the water was almost as uncomfortable as their recovery from the uh, orbital environment. But that was the, that was the mission that earned uh, Neil Armstrong his chit to, uh, uh, to be an Apollo astronaut and uh, eventually to land, be the first to land on the moon. Okay, so while we were uh, flying the Gemini missions, we're also inventing the Apollo uh, systems. The, uh, the Saturn rocket, uh, of course, comprising uh, three stages, five F1 uh, liquid oxygen, uh, liquid kerosene engines, uh, then five J2 liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen engines, and then one J2 for the third stage. So we were inventing this system, uh, checking it out, and uh, making sure it would perform for us, and in fact, the Saturn V remains the most powerful rocket ever built, and it remains the most reliable. This is the only rocket before or since that never had a failure. Really a remarkable piece uh, of equipment. Uh, and so, uh, of course, that's not the only piece of uh, equipment that's required. We also needed the Apollo Command and Service Module, the Apollo capsule, which would hold the three crew and actually be the only piece of the architecture that returns all the way back to Earth. And then the service module, which provides uh, all the power and propulsion and everything else needed for the transit from the Earth to the Moon and, uh, and back again. And then finally, the most unlikely spacecraft imaginable, the Lunar Excursion Module, which uh, is quite an amazing contraption. It actually violates a lot of design principles that NASA really adheres to because there's essentially one engine for descent uh, to the lunar surface and then one engine for ascent. And if, uh, if there's a failure in either one of those, either you're not going to land or you're not going uh, to make it back. And to tell you how cramped it is inside this guy, there's a, uh, one of those little pointers up there says, crewman sitting on engine cover. 
That doesn't sound very comfortable, but, that, but that's, how, uh, that's how tight the space is uh, uh, in this vehicle. But it performed uh, marvelously, and if, well, as we'll talk about, we took Hall 13, it performed above and beyond its, uh, its expectations. But then we ran into a, a terrible, terrible situation. Apollo 1, the fire that killed Virgil, uh, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. They were doing a pre-flight test of the first uh, Apollo launch, and their uh, electrical short in their crew capsule caused the capsule to catch fire. The way the uh, hatch was constructed, it opened to the inside, uh, but in their strapped-in configuration, they were unable to free themselves and open the hatch. Besides, at the time they could uh, do that, the heat was beginning to uh, warp the whole spacecraft, and they were lost. Terrible tragedy for uh, the American Team of Space Flight Program, uh, and really quite a uh, shock to, uh, to NASA and the system, and quite a, quite a setback, a lot of, a lot of soul-searching as a result of that, uh, uh, of that failure. But, uh, and, and then think about the time frame that we're in here, okay? We're in, we're in January 1967, right? Kennedy has committed us to accomplishing the Apollo moon landing before the decade is out. So there's not a lot of time left on the clock. Uh, and then you think about what else is going on uh, in the country uh, at this time, right? We're in, we're in the quagmire of the Vietnam War. We've had political assassinations both before and after. A time of tremendous turmoil. And then to see the space program have this catastrophic failure, uh, it, it really put the country in a, I think, in a, in a dark mood. There was, however, some uh, strains of, of optimism. Uh, it, it, it's, it's fascinating to look back and to see what, uh, what Star Trek represented. It ran for, for three years, through 1966 through the uh, beginning of, uh, of 69. Uh, but it really c captured, I think, a lot of people's hopes, because what it really said was, with this cast of characters out in the future, that, that we might actually survive this era of mutually assured destruction after all. Um, there might actually be peace among nations that would allow uh, an international multiracial crew uh, to unite and, and, and combine and explore uh, together. Um, and it was really uh, space exploration that was the, the, the vehicle, if you will, of those, of those hopes. It was the container of, uh, of those aspirations. And so uh, there was some optimism still extant at the time. And uh, so we, uh, we pressed on. One year and uh, nine months of that reigning clock was used up in re redesigning the Apollo capsule and in uh, designing the next mission. Each crew, by the way, designs their own mission patch and, and they try to work into the mission patch something unique about that mission. Uh, and so with this one, it was the first test of the Apollo uh, Command and Service module with uh, Shira, Isley, and Cunningham in, uh, uh, in flight. So, so a tremendous confidence booster that we could actually uh, use this system successfully. The redesigned Apollo capsule performed fabulously, and we used that opportunity of that tragedy to make a lot of improvements uh, across the board in that, in that vehicle. Then we went to, uh, as a result of that confidence booster, we went right to, we went right to uh, Apollo 8, uh, get a huge leap, right? What we did, as indicated in the mission patch here, was this was the first mission that flew uh, away from the Earth and visited another planetary body. It circumnavigated uh, the moon with Borman, uh, Lovell, and Anders. This is the famous uh, Earthrise uh, picture taken by Bill Anders. You normally see it in a 45 degree configuration, right? But this is the configuration in which Anders actually took the photograph, right? Because what we're doing with uh, the Apollo missions is approaching the moon and landing in the equatorial zone. And so this is the orientation of the picture. It's usually seen in the, the way it's shown in the, uh, uh, in the stamp here. But a uh, very famous photograph and a uh, very famous stamp. The, uh, the in the beginning, God comes from the Apollo 8 crew's Christmas Eve message.
there was a uh, uh, interesting thing about that. The, you may remember the name Madeline Murray O'Hare, who was big in the news back in the day. And, and she sued NASA uh, over this. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court, which then uh, threw out the case because I think they decided the moon was not in their jurisdiction. Uh, so having successfully accomplished Apollo 8, we then went on to uh, uh, Apollo 9. Again, as the, uh, the mission patch indicates, its mission was to test, be the first test of the lunar excursion module. So we're back in Earth orbit for this mission. Uh, it does not leave Earth orbit, but it, uh, it tests the deployment of the LEM uh, and then the firing of the LEM engine and then the, and then the re rendezvous back with the service module. So we had to test that out before we knew uh, that we were ready to go back to uh, the moon with that, uh, with that system. Apollo 10 was, uh, was the final test of the entire configuration. It went uh, to the moon. They deployed, uh, we deployed the, the Apollo, uh, sorry, the, we, the, the lunar excursion module with Young and Cernan inside, and we went, descended to within nine miles of the lunar surface. And uh, this allowed us to, to test in-orbit lunar operations, that lunar operations uh, uh, rendezvous that uh, John Hubel uh, invented. And the system performed uh, brilliantly and it gave us the confidence that we, uh, uh, that we were ready to go to the surface of the moon. The reason why you see Snoopy and Charlie Brown here is that's what the crew named uh, their vehicles. Snoopy is the LEM and uh, Charlie Brown is the command and service module. And then finally, Apollo 11, we were finally ready to go with Armstrong, Collins, and Aldrin. And as you can see from their patch, this was really the, the, the goal, to fulfill Kennedy's commitment to land on the surface of the moon and return again uh, safely. Uh, this was a bit of a challenge, making, uh, uh, making that landing happen. And so what's happening here is now the, uh, uh, Michael Collins is alone in the command and service module in lunar orbit. Aldrin and uh, Armstrong are in the LEM descending to the surface. And uh, what's, what's going on here, and you may have seen this uh, in YouTube or, or, or somewhere else, is Aldrin and Armstrong in the LEM are descending to the, the lunar surface. Uh, the idea is that you, you have this, uh, this descent motor on the back and uh, on the bottom to control the descent, and then you have, uh, you have attitude control thrust thrusters to keep the, the spacecraft upright. Uh, as they're descending, they get to 700 feet above the surface. Uh, they look out the window, and they see they're landing in a boulder field, uh, where these boulders are the sides of automobiles. Uh, and they're pretty densely uh, strewn on the surface, and so they're thinking, this isn't going to work. Uh, and so Armstrong takes control of the LEM, he puts it in manual control, and he uses those attitude control thrusters to essentially fly the LEM like a helicopter and move it laterally across the surface of the moon until he can find a place where they're, they're, they're relatively boulder free. They finally find one with 30 seconds of fuel left, and they, uh, and they bring it down from 700 feet to, uh, uh, to the surface. Okay, and, and then of course we're now on the surface of the moon, and uh, uh, You'll see, uh, and currently it's upside down. you may remember monitor, watching this live, out, uh, fair of detail. if you're old enough. Okay, we can verify the position, uh, the uh, opening I ought to have on the camera. Stand by. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming. Okay, I just checked uh, getting back up to that first step. Uh, it's uh, not even collapsed too far, but uh, it's adequate to get back up. Roger, we copy. It's a pretty good little jump. Buzz, this is Houston, F2, 1 1 60th second for shadow photography on the sequence camera. Okay. Um, uh, at the foot of the ladder, the LEM footbeds are only uh, uh, depressed in the surface about uh, one or two inches, uh, although the surface appears to be uh, very very fine grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Ground mass uh, is very fine. 
That was new information. We really had no idea how thick the dust layer was on the moon until they landed. So uh, nobody uh, nobody wrote that for uh, Neil Armstrong. He uh, uh, he made that up himself. He made it up during the flight uh, as he was in transit from the Earth to, uh, uh, to the Moon, and it just ca encapsulated for uh, for him. I think what this uh, what this meant. I think uh, he, he did well. Uh, he did better than any poet uh, they could have. Uh, and so this is uh, the famous picture of uh, Buzz Aldrin on the moon. You can see uh, Neil Armstrong reflected in his visor. He's actually taking the picture. Um, uh, the, the camera on the limb is showing them uh, plant the flag. Uh, and then I've included this because it's actually one of the few pictures uh, of Neil Armstrong on the moon. Uh, most of the pictures are of Buzz because they don't have the camera. He handed off his, his Buzz. I need to get, or Neil said, I need to get uh, at least one. So, <laughs> so they were able to get, uh, to get that shot. Um, and then... Uh, uh, of course, you're all familiar with the, the return and the big parade and the, and the, the, the weeks-long quarantine because they weren't sure if there was any, they were bringing back any nasties from the moon or not, but they endured all that. Um, we followed then shortly thereafter uh, in November with Apollo 12. Uh, they call this the Yankee Clipper crew because it was an all-U.S. Navy crew. Uh, the goal here was precision landing on the moon. Uh, so what you see in the upper right is the Surveyor spacecraft, a uh, robotic spacecraft, that was launched several years before to do investigations on the surface of the moon in preparation for Apollo. We wanted to see how close we could get to it. And we got within about a couple of hundred yards. And so it was a, a successful ability to, uh, to land in a precise location on the, uh, on the moon. Every one of these uh, subsequent missions, you're adding uh, capability, learning to do uh, new things. Apollo 13, as you can see from their mission packs, patch ex luna, scientia, this, this mission was really the first one to really try and expand the science we had a great number of uh, lunar experiments they were going to leave on the surface. Of course, you know, they're all here in this picture, pre-flight smiling, but uh, they weren't smiling, I think, much during the mission. Uh, this one, as you recall uh, from the history and from the movie, there was an explosion of an O2 tank in the service module that blew out one side of the spacecraft and rendered this vehicle uh, useless. And uh, so very dramatic uh, turn of events. If you saw the movie of Paul 13, Ron Howard did a terrific job capturing the, the realism uh, of that. He spent a lot of time at Johnson Space Center uh, working with uh, the flight controllers and talking with uh, astronauts and really trying to get it right. I think he did a marvelous, uh, marvelous job. Uh, it, was, it was quite uh, an effort and a quite a cause for, uh, for celebration. This is the uh, lunar module Aquarius, uh, which I mentioned earlier, it had to outperform all of its design specifications because it became now the tugboat to bring the uh, crew back safely from, from lunar orbit to the Earth. The LEM was built by uh, the Grumman Corporation, the, the command and service module was built by North American Rockwell. And so after the uh, mission was successfully accomplished, the crew was rescued, the president of Grumman sent to the president of North American Rockwell a bill for 13 cents a mile for towing charges. <laughs> Apollo 14, again, now this, we're, we're expanding our science capability on the moon, uh, as 13 was supposed to do. So they, they, uh, this was also an opportunity for Alan Shepard, the first American in space, to, uh, to be involved in a lunar mission. So he uh, got to fly to the moon, uh, land on the moon, and uh, hit the first golf ball on the moon. Uh, Apollo 15, uh, the advanced capability here was now about around mobility, surface mobility on the moon. Uh, and so they flew essentially a dune buggy to the moon, and they drove for uh, 37 kilometers in this uh, vehicle, uh, driving around. Uh, the idea, of course, is, is you want the, the moon is a diverse geographic, uh, sorry, geological uh, entity like any body you, you might expect. And so you want to be able to collect a diverse set of samples. The service mobility is key to collecting a diversity of samples. And so it wasn't about just a joyride, it was about being able to get the, a diversity of samples to really understand uh, lunar, uh, the lunar geology, lunar history. Oh, I forgot to mention it. Just, just kind of, uh, Irwin, on the way back, uh, had uh, essentially a heart attack on the, uh, on, the, on the trip coming back. And they were quite concerned about uh, what to do about that. And so the flight surgeon thought about it after initial shock and thought, wait a minute, 
Okay, so he's in a 100% oxygen environment, he's continuously monitored, and he's in zero gravity, so there's no stress on his physique. So he really is kind of in an ICU, we're, we're okay. Uh, and so they got him back and he was, uh, he was safe, they were able to tend to him when he, uh, when he landed, but uh, he really was, believe it or not, in an ideal environment. If you were gonna have a heart attack, that's a great circumstance to be in. Apollo uh, uh, 16, John Young, TK Mattingly, and Charlie Duke, you remember uh, Mattingly was uh, the one who got thrown off the Apollo 13 mission because the flight surgeon was afraid he was gonna have the measles. Uh, he got his chance. Uh, and Apollo 16 was able to fly that mission. And there again, focused on uh, science experiment distribution and uh, put a lot more miles on the, uh, the lunar rover, uh, collected a great many more samples for uh, return and emplacement of laser retroreflectors and other uh, permanent experiments on the moon. Yes, he was able to get the front wheels off the ground. I don't know what would happen if you'd have flopped it over, but uh, yeah, right, come off the ground, right, right. And then finally, Apollo 17 uh, with uh, CERN and Evans and uh, Harrison Jack Schmidt. The significance of this mission was that uh, Jack Schmidt is, was the first card-carrying scientist uh, on the moon. He was actually a PhD geologist, uh, and they, they wanted a geologist on the moon, again, to, to uh, really do uh, sample selection, really bring back the best samples, particularly since this was gonna be the, gonna be the last mission. And so uh, six out of uh, seven missions to uh, the moon uh, made it. Uh, amazingly, we brought everybody back alive. I, I still, I'm amazed when I think of the technology, of the, of the adversity, of the kind of things that they encountered, uh, and the fact that we brought everybody back alive continues to uh, uh, astound me. And so uh, the, the, I love this uh, shot. They, there was a, we left a film camera uh, on one of the experiments on the moon, and we were able to uh, uh, film the Apollo 17 liftoff from the surface. It amazes me that, uh, that that worked all six times too. Uh, really an, an astonishingly good piece of equipment. Uh, so this is the, the plaque that Apollo 17 left on the moon, parallel to the one that was left behind on Apollo 11. Here man completed his first explorations of the moon, December 1972. May the spirit of peace in which we came be reflected in the lives of all mankind. So what I want to do now is I'd love to be able to, uh, I've, I've got um, more on what happens after this uh, and what we're doing today in space exploration. But I wanted to pause here and I wanted to get your thoughts on how the Apollo program affected you or how, you've, how it changed your view of things or any, I think any questions that you have about, uh, uh, about that program before we move on. Any, uh, any thoughts, any impressions? Sir. Okay, why did we stop after 17? Uh, political will. Okay. Uh, President Nixon felt that the uh, program had accomplished its goals, it accomplished the commitment that Kennedy laid out, uh, uh, that it was uh, an expensive activity to undertake, to, to continue to do. We initially, of course, had uh, seven, uh, 18, 19, and 20 in the books to, uh, to fly. Um, he was not willing to invest uh, the funds or the political capital that uh, the Kennedy was in the program. And so he wanted something that, was, uh, that we could throttle back to, and that, that's why. And that's frankly been the story ever since. Uh, progress in space exploration, or lack thereof, uh, is almost totally a function of, of, of national political will. More than technology, uh, more than science, uh, even more than money. Uh, but that's, that's essentially, the, in a nutshell, the story. I'll show you what we did uh, in its place at a lower, uh, at a lower expenditure level uh, after this. Other uh, lots of questions? Yeah. So the Russians, you know, they were the first out with Sputnik. And right. Maybe I missed something, but did the Russians land on the moon like we did? Or? No, they did not. <laughs> they, uh, they, they gave up the effort. Uh, they felt uh, that they were not able to uh, make the investments that they wanted to, given everything else that was on their plate. Uh, they, they were looking at the geopolitical chessboard and decided, no, we'll continue a space program, uh, but we're not going to try and get to uh, the moon. The Americans have, 
have done it. They were able to make that investment. And uh, 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 it, uh, it, almost in parallel with the uh, years later with uh, the Star Wars thing. We could talk about that if you want to. But, but they essentially, in their calculus, decided that it was not worth the investment to try and do something that the U.S. already did. And do, do you know how much uh, money the U.S. spent going to the moon? In, uh, in those year dollars, about $24 billion, which would be you know, 100 and big, uh, 170-ish in uh, today's dollars. Uh, uh, amazingly, at its peak, NASA was getting 4% of the national budget, 4%. Uh, since then, the last uh, 20 years, it's been less than half a percent. So national priorities have evolved and changed over time. At the height of the Apollo program, that was a significant, significant investment of, uh, of the nation's resources. Any thoughts before we move on? Or do you want to hear about uh, what happens next? Yeah, Beth. I just want to say that James Irwin was in Richland, and he was at our church at West Side Church mm -hmm. and uh, gave speeches and told us things. It was pretty exciting to have him. Oh, cool. Yeah. 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 And the other thing I'd like to say about this is I love the logos for each mm -hmm. slide. Mm -hmm. I think that is so neat that they did that. And they're all so different. That's the artist part of me. Yeah, right. I really like them. Yeah, and it's still tradition all the way through uh, the subsequent programs, through the, the shuttle program and the space station program. Uh, the crews design their mission patches to reflect what they believe is important about what they're doing. Yeah. Anybody ever calculated the technology? Obviously, a lot of technology was developed during the development of these programs, and how that technology then been transferred to the commercial and to the to other other industries. Anybody ever done any real evaluation of that? I think there's a lot of benefit. Yeah, there, there has been. So there's, there, it comes in two packages. You know, one is, is sort of the, the uh, uh, historical actual following of the technologies. Uh, and so NASA has kept a careful record of that. And you could go on NASA's website at the Google spinoffs, and you'll see all the things that came out of that uh, program, uh, uh, things like CT uh, scan technology and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, there's also been some economic valuations that have been done. And, uh, uh, th th because it's an economic analysis, there's more controversy around that. But uh, estimates that I've seen have said that for every dollar that was spent uh, in the Apollo program, seven dollars were uh, accrued to the U.S. economy in terms of, of, uh, te of technological uh, growth that led to economic growth. So a pretty good return on investment for uh, uh, relative to some other things you might think we spend money on. Uh. Yeah. What? Uh the, the labels Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, what was the, uh, why the different names? I mean, were they all just one long success and they grouped them and gave them, what, what the, uh, discriminated one group from another? Yeah, so it really is, is uh, missions and what you wanted to accomplish. Mercury was about, can we safely fly in space? Can we understand uh, uh, human health and performance at, at the most basic level? Uh, we we'd had some experience with high altitude flight, but nothing with uh, with orbital flight. And so Mercury was all about uh, inventing the the systems for uh, not only for uh, the propulsion and all that, but also for the the environmental control and life support for the for the astronaut. Uh, Gemini was was advancing that capability to be able to do spacewalks, automated rendezvous and docking, really truly in orbit operations uh, to to really do routine uh, space flight. Uh, and then Apollo was, can we get out of the Earth's gravity well? Can we, can we leave Earth orbit and operate around another uh, celestial body, the, the moon? So it was really those broad groupings. Right. Anything else? If not, I'll take a little bit of more time to talk about where, we, where we've been since and what we're doing next. Okay, so uh, a couple thoughts before I do that on, uh, on uh, uh, impacts. Uh, uh, one impact is on uh, international relations. The, the, the Russians and the U.S. Uh, both have tremendous capabilities in space, and we use that, in our, and the policymakers use that 
as a leverage point, a point of contact. And so this is Nixon and his counterpart, uh, Brezhnev's in the back, and I can't remember the name of the, the gentleman at the other bit of the table, but they're signing the agreement to do the Apollo-Soyuz test program, where we flew an Apollo capsule, they flew a Soyuz capsule, the two rendezvoused and docked in space. A political demonstration of potential cooperation, but also very practical uh, as well, in that the Outer Space Treaty, uh, which uh, most of the world nations have subscribed to, talk about a commitment to mutual assistance and rescue in this times of space emergency. And this was a practical demonstration of that capability. Uh, but it really was a, 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 a sort of a, the poster child for detente um, in that era, if you remember that era of U.S.-Soviet relations. And, and that has continued through to the present day. We, when the Soviet Union collapsed and the Russian Federation became the, the, uh, the political form of government there, we brought the Russians into the space station program and made them a full partner along with Europe and Japan and Canada uh, because we wanted their engagement and also we wanted their scientists and engineers to be doing something besides uh, making weapons to sell to other nations. And so it was a, really a good thing to do all the way around. And even when we have dark uh, political chapters and episodes with our Russian counterparts, the space program remains a point of contact where we can continue to have dialogue and engagement um, uh, above the fray, if you will. And uh, that is, has yielded diplomatic benefits uh, uh, ever since then. The Apollo 17 iconic uh, image of the, uh, of the full disk of the Earth. Historians looking back at the uh, environmental movement that really began in the late 60s, especially in the 70s, really attribute the public rallying around that to two things. One is the, uh, the image of the Earth of Apollo. The other is the publication of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, uh, which, if you recall, really talked about the impacts of, of chemicals and pesticides in the environment, and DDT in particular, led to the banning of DDT. Some historians will say it's really these two things that, that really spawned the modern environmental movement in America. So uh, an interesting side uh, product of the, uh, uh, of the Apollo program. Uh, and then there's the impact on the, uh, the astronauts uh, themselves. Uh, Buzz Aldrin, uh, he, he was, uh, uh, he's a really interesting guy. He's still very active. Um, Buzz, if you're, if you're a Presbyterian, he, he was a Presbyterian and actually took communion on the moon uh, with him. Buzz and his family have a, he has a long history of mental illness in his family. His mother actually committed suicide not long after his return from the moon. And he struggled himself with um, uh, mental health issues. And this impact of being in space and seeing the earth from outer space was part of that equation. And he gave a very poignant speech that I happened to attend a number of years ago in New York, a public speech where he talked about mental health issues and his work the 20 years after this mission in mental health advocacy at the public level. Uh, and then, you know, 20 years later, for the last 25 years, he's been back involved in the space program and really advocating for Mars missions. But uh, his own family history and his experience as a, an Apollo astronaut really led him to invest the next 20 years of his life in mental health issues. James Irwin, uh, Bev alluded to earlier, he and Dave Scott both became Christians as a result of their Apollo missions. And Irwin himself actually led several expeditions to Mount Ararat to look for Noah's Ark. And uh, uh, so uh, profoundly impacted by the Apollo program. Edgar Mitchell went on to, uh, to found something called the Institute for Noetic Sciences in California, which is kind of out there looking at parapsychology and all kinds of wacky, you know, UFO kind of funky stuff. And so he, he uh, uh, but again, he attributes his interest in those issues to having flown these Apollo missions. And so at a personal level, there's an impact um, uh, for the folks who were engaged in uh, that process. Uh, and I guess one more thing I'll say, because I, I met a lot, of the, a lot of the people when I went to work for NASA, uh, Apollo was their formative experience uh, uh, in the agency. And uh, Apollo uh, was the ruin of a lot of marriages. There were a lot of people giving countless hours to the program and their, their, their marriages didn't survive it. Uh, and so that was one of the things that the agency had to learn about, you know, how hard do we push people? Uh, how do we really want to set arbitrary dates uh, for political reasons? Or, or should we, these things really ought to pursue, should we let them pr be pursued at a more natural pace? And so uh, we've learned some hard lessons as an agency on that score as well. Okay, and then uh, ironically, perhaps, uh, the most famous person associated with the Apollo program was probably the person least changed by it. Uh, Neil Armstrong was a very private person prior to uh, the Apollo 1 mission, Apollo 11 mission. He was also, uh, according to many people uh, interviewed, maybe people who knew him, about the most humble person 
the most self-effacing person they, they ever met. Never wanted to be, uh, be the center of attention, always wanted to talk in terms of the mission and the other people that were involved. Uh, and, that was, and he was the same way after the flight. You know, he, he left the astronaut corps, didn't want to be in the spotlight, went back to the University of, of Cincinnati, taught engineering, uh, and then would emerge at various times when we needed him. For example, after the Challenger accident, he co-chaired the Challenger Commission uh, with, uh, with William Rogers to investigate the cause of that uh, accident, what we might do in addition. But ironically, I think the person who was most famous out of all that was the one who was least changed uh, uh, in it. Uh, so this is something about his, uh, uh, his character. So where do we go from there? So I mentioned earlier there was, or there was gonna be Apollo 18, 19, and 20. Uh, the president canceled that program, and so we thought, well, gosh, we got all this, this uh, Apollo hardware lying around. What can we do to advance human spaceflight at a lower uh, budget level? And so Skylab was born, America's first space station. Uh, we created the, the Skylab module. We flew three Apollo missions to it with three astronauts each for successively longer periods of time. Again, the goal to be how long can the human operate uh, in space? And so I think Owen Garriott and his crew, uh, w which flew at Skylab 3, were uh, 89 days, if I remember correctly. Gathered a lot of data on human health and performance through that, uh, that program. Then a seven-year hiatus in human spaceflight before the launch of the first space shuttle. Uh, we flew 135 space shuttle missions between uh, 1981 and uh, 2013. And uh, uh, this was a great picture. This is uh, Young and Crippen. Young was one of the Apollo astronauts. He's hung around for space station flu, was a commander of the first space shuttle mission. And he picked uh, Bob Crippen to be his uh, co-pilot. The reason why is because in the intervening six years, you think what was going on in engineering at that time, this is the emergence of, of software, uh, of, of controlling a lot of systems through software. And uh, Young says, look, if we're going to fly this thing, I want a software guy. And so uh, Crippen was the astronaut with the most expertise in, uh, in flight software. And so he was, the, uh, he was selected to fly with Crippen and STS-1. And then these four folks here are the, uh, are the, last, uh, the crew of the last space shuttle mission, uh, 135. And uh, the space shuttle accomplished a great many things. It accomplished the, the, uh, the deployment and servicing of the Hubble Space Telescope, the deployment of the Galileo and Cassini probes, uh, the, the Space Lab program, which was a microgravity and life sciences uh, a program, but it also had some, uh, some tragedies to it, too. This was the crew of the, uh, the Space Shuttle Challenger that was lost about six months after I joined the agency, and then we, of course, lost the Columbia crew as well. Interesting side note on that, the previous NASA administrator, the one who was there when uh, the last part of my tenure, uh, Charlie Bolden, went, uh, was being interviewed by a of the National Academy of Sciences, because they were doing a study about future spaceflight. And they asked Charlie, uh, Mr. Administrator, what was the most important NASA program and why? And he said, the space shuttle, because it brought diversity to the astronaut corps. And I was in that room at the time, and I thought, well, that's kind of a weird answer, because you know, I, was, I was raised with all these other guys to be a propeller head, you know. The, the thing that's important is what the machine can do. But the more I thought about it, Charlie was exactly right. Because under the space shuttle program, we had, we had more and more flight opportunities. We had uh, adapting to societal change. We had uh, women and minorities in the astronaut corps. And, and it, it did what, what NASA needed to do because NASA was America's space program and all of America ought to participate. And uh, the shuttle made that possible. And so I think Charlie was, uh, was absolutely right. Uh, but back to the propeller, propeller head part of it. Uh, the most important thing the shuttle did was to help lead to the assembly of the International Space Station, which is flying uh, today, will be flying for the next, uh, through 2025 at least. Uh, if you have family members, loved ones who are 20 years old and younger, they have never lived in a world where people weren't operating in space. Uh, that's how long the space station's been, uh, been created, it's been permanently occupied since then. And uh, is, is where we're really learning to, uh, to perform in space, uh, doing long duration missions, uh, all kinds of experiments, uh, both for astronomy, uh, looking outward, and uh, for life and microgravity sciences on the inside. Incidentally, this is one of my favorites, the coldest place in the universe, the coldest place, think about that, the coldest place in the universe is a locker on the International Space Station where we fly the cold atom lab experiment. Anybody know what a de Broglie wave is? You familiar with that, if you're, if you're a physics person? Um, you familiar with the idea that, that light uh, exhibits waves, uh, exhibits the characteristics of a wave and a particle, right? Uh, photons. Uh, what de Broglie uh, theorized way back in the 20s was that, that uh, any, uh, any atom, any particle, uh, would exhibit the same thing if you could get it cold enough. Uh, and so on Earth, 
some folks who have now been, uh, who are now Nobel Prize winners, uh, took a potassium atom uh, and essentially put it in a vacuum and slowed it down enough to where it began to smear, began to exhibit the properties of a wave, a de Broglie wave. Um, and uh, what, they, what those Nobel laureates thought was, working with us, is, hey, you know, space station represents an opportunity because one of the forces acting on an atom that you've got to try and null out is gravity. Gravity introduces force on that atom, which creates heat, which creates motion, and, and, and it leads to that, that you know, atomic stability. And so where they were able to get maybe half a second uh, of de Broglie wave on the Earth, going to space station, they could use a potassium atom and put in that locker, cool it down, can't null out gravity because you're on the space station, and get a hang time, if you will, of five seconds, which if you're a particle physicist is an eternity. Uh, so anyway, that's the trivia. Uh, but lots of cool things happening on, uh, on space station, uh, in, including the flight of these folks. This is Mark and Scott Kelly, both uh, astronauts, uh, identical twins. Um, Mark Kelly, you may remember, is married to Gabrielle Giffords, who was the member of Congress who was the victim of an assassination attempt in Florida by some crazy uh, character. He left the astronaut corps after his last mission to care for her, help with her rehabilitation. Uh, his brother Scott stayed in the astronaut corps and was going to fly the one-year mission with a Russian cosmonaut uh, Vladimir Konyekov. Uh, Vladimir Konyekov. Uh, in any case, they were going to fly on space station for an entire year again to, to, to test the human health and performance in preparation for an eventual Mars mission, which would be that or longer. Uh, and so he flew for a year, and then Scott thought, oh, wait a minute. If I'm going to be up there for a year, here's an opportunity. I've got an identical twin who's going to be on the Earth, and we know everything about him because we have all this data from when he was an astronaut. Why don't we run some experiments about, we'll do the same thing on him, on Earth to him, that you're going to do to me in orbit, and then we'll compare the results. And uh, so they collected uh, urine samples and DNA and all that kind of stuff. And finally, last April, uh, Science Magazine dedicated an entire issue to the results of that experiment. And they called the Twin Study. And what it demonstrated was the, uh, the resilience and robustness of how a human body can adapt to a multitude of changes introduced by the spaceflight environment. Uh, gene expression levels, uh, epigenetic changes. Uh, in fact, you know, both were given a flu vaccine to behave the same way uh, in space as it did on the Earth. Changes in Scott's microbiome diversity were in space were no greater than stress-related changes on Earth. All these results uh, giving confidence that we can do Mars-class missions with humans and not have terribly adverse effects, assuming we can work the radiation problem, which we're actively involved in. So a uh, very important study. And so we're continuing then to select astronauts. This is the last class of astronauts selected while I was still uh, at NASA. We call them ASCANs, astronaut candidates, because they, we select them. There were, there were 13,000 people that applied. We selected these uh, 12. Uh, and they, for the first two years, they're ASCANs until they, they get through their training. And then once they get through those two years of training, they're now selected to be, they're now eligible to be assigned to a mission. And this group includes Richland's owned Kyla Barron, Richland High School class of 2006. So hopefully you can get her to come back and speak uh, sometime and she'll tell you uh, the inside story about what it means to be an astronaut. And so uh, we're now poised, learning what we have on space station to explore the moon uh, and Mars. And I like this picture because it illustrates the current and ongoing debate between what I call the Martians and the lunatics. Where should we go next? Should we go back to the moon or should we go on to Mars? That is a hotly debated question with uh, uh, politicians on both sides, with engineers on both sides, with scientists on both sides, with astronauts on both sides uh, of, the, uh, of the question. And so uh, what my boss did, KG uh, fellow that he was, uh, if I can get back to the last slide, was uh, to say, while you folks are arguing about that, uh, I'm going to build the systems that we're going to need regardless of destination. I'm going to build uh, the, the next generation launch vehicle with, uh, with a Saturn V class capability and the next generation crew capsule, which will be capable of deep space flight, whether you're going to Mars orbit or back to the moon. And so we've been building these systems ever since. Uh, this gives you a sense for how big they are. If you're a rocket guy, you're familiar with uh, Elon Musk's Falcon vehicles. This is the Atlas V, which is a workhorse uh, vehicle for launching satellites. Uh, and then the, the SLS, the, build, the, the vehicle we're building, the Space Launch System, has with these three configurations, the initial vehicle being a 70 metric ton, and then 105, which we think is ideal for lunar missions, 130 uh, metric tons payload capacity if we're going to do Mars missions. And so uh, these are what are in development now. Let's see. This is the first stage of that, uh, 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 of that Space Launch System vehicle. 
Uh, and this big thing around, anybody have, a, anybody have a can crusher in your home where you take your aluminum can or your metal can and you put it in and you crush it? That's what this structure is. It's a big old can crusher. Uh, what, we do, what we're doing is we're putting the first stage of the, uh, the new launch vehicle in here, and we're going to drop a bunch of force on it, we're going to drop a bunch of mass on it, and we're going to test it till it crushes. Uh, and the reason is because uh, we want to know uh, at, at exactly what point this is going to give way. We, we want to know, because when you're going to fly into orbit, if you're going to escape Earth's gravity, mass is everything. The more mass you can reduce, the more payload you can carry. So this experiment is designed to tell us how much mass can we take out of this structure and still have it withstand the forces of launch. Uh, and the can crusher is, uh, is, is, is telling us that. Uh, and then this is the Orion crew vehicle. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the command module, the equivalent of, of the command module in, uh, uh, in Apollo, except this guy could hold up to six uh, astronauts. And then the service module being built by our partners in the European Space Agency. And this guy here is a crew escape system. So if you're sitting on top of this rocket, something goes haywire, this guy will blast off and lift this entire capsule uh, off and carry it a safe distance uh, away. So uh, that's all in, uh, in development. This is the completed, uh, except for the outer uh, silver panels, this is the completed Orion spacecraft, been delivered to the Kennedy Space Center. This is the spacecraft that we will fly on the first flight, Exploration Mission 2, the first human flight of the, uh, uh, of the new launch system that will go back to uh, the moon. This is the current NASA Administrator, uh, Jim Bridenstine. So just two uh, quick views of the moon you don't see every day. This is the moon, this is actually taken from the ground in Alexandria, Virginia, with the space station happened to be flying in Earth orbit and passing in front of the moon. And you see a magnified pictures of it, uh, of it kind of there. And then another picture of the moon you don't see every day. This is a multi-temporal illumination map of the lunar south pole. As I mentioned earlier, all the Apollo missions went to the equatorial region of the moon. We want to go next to the south pole. The reason why is because uh, this is Shackleton Crater near the, near the South Pole. We have discovered with the NASA, NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that there are ice deposits in the permanently shadowed regions of the Lunar South Pole. We want to use that ice because uh, uh, it's, it's useful for everything. You, you could use it uh, for water, you could use it for rocket fuel, you could do all kinds of great stuff with it. So we want to go to the Lunar South Pole. And then, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, the politicians and everybody disagree with where we should go. When uh, George Bush was uh, president, it was back to the moon. When President Obama was president, no, let's skip the moon, been there, done that, let's go to Mars. Now with President Trump, you know, let's go back, uh, let's go back uh, to the moon. And standing with him, for example, is, uh, is Harrison Schmidt, uh, who I mentioned earlier. He was the Apollo 17 astronaut that walked on the moon, the geologist. He's all about going back to the moon, and he wants to mine that ice. He thinks he can get uh, helium-3 and, and build fission reactors on, uh, fusion reactors on the moon. We tried to tell him, you know, maybe you ought to demonstrate it on Earth first, but he, was, uh, he would not be deterred. Uh, he wants to go uh, that route. And so that, that's uh, the president signing National Space Policy Directive number one, calling for us to work with the private sector uh, for human return to the moon. And if I had lots of time, I would get into this particular story. This is the new thing that's under the sun. Uh, space programs were traditionally the province of governments, uh, but in the last 10, 15 years, there are private sector players in the game with significant capability. Uh, with their own motivations for going into space. Uh, we want to leverage that capability. And so the next missions to the, to, uh, uh, the moon will be in partnership, uh, not just you know, letting, us letting out contracts, but actually partnering with private sector companies that put their own skin in the game uh, for their own purposes. Uh, and we think that's going to be a very effective way uh, to make progress in space uh, with, uh, with fewer tax dollars. And so it, to implement that plan, uh, the, the president has now said, okay, not only do I want you to go back to the moon, I want you to do it by 2024. And so we've accepted, the agency has accepted that challenge. Uh, the Congress has not yet accepted it because they have not yet appropriated sufficient funds uh, to get there by 2024. So again, it's that political will debate. We don't know how that's gonna come out just yet, but we wanna be, uh, we wanna be ready with the mission architectures and the partnerships uh, uh, in place. Uh, this is Gateway, uh, it was Gateway. Um, Gateway is a, uh, essentially a space station in miniature in high lunar orbit. And the idea is there from that high lunar orbit, we can uh, do minimum energy transfers to the lunar surface, but also from Gateway to Mars. Uh, and so we want it to be our, essentially our way station to, the, uh, to either destination. Um, and then I mentioned earlier about American companies. We are, we are working now with 11 American companies that have expressed interest in uh, developing with us lunar descent vehicles, crewed lunar descent vehicles. We're starting with unmanned ones, then going to crewed, uh, uh, crewed meaning C-R-E-W-E-D, not C-R-U-D-E, 
Uh, yeah, so I've, my, my diction is not sufficiently subtle to capture that distinction. Uh, but in any case, that's what we're doing, and we're hoping to, and we've got several, 11 companies on tap, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll neck them down as they, uh, as they compete with each other to, uh, to two or three. Uh, and then just to show you that the debate continues, even the astronauts disagree on what should be next. Uh, you come back and try it again. Yeah, I guess we can. Well, Mars that's a long time. <laughs> ah, that's a long time. How do you feel about it? Michael Collins. Mars Direct. You like it direct? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it seems to me Mars Direct. You're I mean, impatient. I mean, who's, who knows better than these people? Right? <laughs> I mean, you know, they've, they've been doing this stuff for a long time. Uh, what about the concept of Mars Direct? So the, the, the challenge is, if we go direct to Mars, so this is the NASA ministry, um, there's going to be a lot of things for, that we haven't yet planet. proven out. We need to think about this. We need to use the resources of another world in order to live and work for long periods of time. Uh, the moon has hundreds of millions of tons of water ice that we discovered back in 2009. Water ice represents life support. It's air to breathe. It's water to drink. It's also rocket fuel, hydrogen and oxygen, the same rocket fuel that powered the space shuttle. So it's available in hundreds of millions of, there's Mr. President, that's a market. That's an available market where people, some of these commercial guys, are interested in going to the moon to utilize that resource for their own stays on the moon. Uh, it could be for tourism. It could be for resources, potentially even flat. But Jim, isn't it true they haven't really landed that close to that portion of the moon that you're talking about? That's correct. In the Apollo era, we landed in the equatorial regions. So from 1969, the first landing, up until 2008 and 2009, many people believed the moon was bone dry. Now we know that there's hundreds of millions of tons of water ice. We need to learn how to use it so we can live and work, and then ultimately that gives us the opportunity to go to Mars. So, so that's you the, feel uh, that that's really the landing that on the moon you saw first on the, on the, and on the earlier slide, the president signing a directive saying, back to the moon. And then a year later, he's got these other guys, other set of astronauts in his office, right, saying, what about Mars Direct? And so, um, and I can't, you know, I can't blame the president for this, right? He's, he's got no particular expertise. No president has any particular expertise in this question, but he's getting conflicting advice, right? Conflicting advice from his advisors, conflicting advice from astronauts about whether it should be Moon or Mars. So the debate continues. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to build the pieces that we need. Um, I'll, I'll uh, just want to end with, with this one. I got a few more things, but we could, I know you're getting tired of me uh, yakking at you. Uh, I wanted to, to have put this picture up. This is an artist's concept, obviously, but what's neat about it, this is, this is a, a picture of an astronaut standing on Mars's moon Phobos. Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. Uh, what's neat about this picture is that Phobos is much closer to Mars than our moon is to the Earth. So if you're standing, like this person is, if you're standing on the surface of Phobos, that's how big Mars looks to you. And so one of the, one of the potential concepts for access to the Martian surface is to stop at, at Phobos and uh, uh, establish a presence there and go from there. So uh, lots of things uh, going on. I can, uh, I, can, I can stop there. I've got more stuff on uh, uh, Mars robotics missions if you're interested in that, but I want to respect your time. Uh, if there's any other uh, uh, questions or conversation, I'm happy to entertain that. Yes, sir. A long time ago, we thought about uh, you know uh, using uh, proton accelerators and things like that, and the propulsion engines. We're going out of weight because it didn't take as much weight. Right. Yeah. And and um, what we're actually thinking of is is essentially a hybrid system: uh, solar electric propulsion uh, mixed with chemical propulsion. Uh, because solar electric is much more uh, much more efficient. Chemical engines uh, give you much more capability to maneuver once you're there. So we believe a hybrid engine is the, uh, the ideal way to go. Where that gateway spacecraft I showed you earlier will be the first test of a 50 kilowatt capacity solar electric propulsion engine. And we believe that if that technology works, that we can scale it up to 180 if we need it, which is what you'd like for a Mars class mission. And then again, coupled with a, uh, uh, with a liquid oxygen, liquid oxygen, hydrogen chemical engine for those uh, Mars orbital maneuvers. You mentioned the problem of radiation exposure on that trip to Mars. Right. What are the leading thoughts on how to prevent? Right. Uh, the the uh, answer is it's not going to be one answer. It's going to be several things. 
Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to involve uh, crew selection because we're learning there's a wide variability in how individual humans uh, uh, respond to uh, uh, that radiation environment. Uh, there's going to be uh, mission timing considerations because uh, we know how to shield generally against uh, heavy protons that come from the sun. Uh, it, it turns out that when you have uh, solar max, right, the, the solar wind pushes against the, uh, the co incoming cosmic radiation and makes for a safer environment with respect to cosmic rays, which are much harder to shield against. So one thought is part of what, what you do is you time the missions to Mars such that you go at solar max. Um, that's another consideration. Uh, a third consideration is shielding. Uh, and so we've, talked, we've looked a lot at, uh, uh, at water, which is a very effective uh, shielding agent. It's also, of course, very heavy, and so weight, and weight is a big deal. Uh, we've also looked at uh, the possibility of magnetic shielding, creating a magnetic field uh, around the spacecraft to uh, uh, defer some of that. And so uh, it'll be a combination of techniques. But uh, we think that we can do this with a combination of techniques to safely get someone to Mars and back. And then the question is, what about the Martian surface? Because the Mars surface is, uh, uh, is not well protected like the Earth is. Uh, and what we've decided, what we've figured out we can do there is that in addition to shielding on a spacecraft, uh, Mars geologically exhibits, uh, ha has lava tubes, uh, essentially caves that are formed by ancient uh, Martian geologic processes. If we put our Martian base next to one of these caves and we have a good solar wind uh, detection capability, which we, which we do, uh, that we can, we can, as an emergency shelter, put our crews there until the solar event passes and then bring them out again. So. Um, We've got some ideas around protection on the Martian surface as well. So we're trying to use all the things that Mars affords uh, uh, as well. It's one of the arguments for, for Mars. Mars is a, is a much more habitable environment than the moon. Um, Mars has much more uh, accessible water ice, right? Wa the, the moon has water ice at the, in the permanently shadowed regions of the South Pole. Mars has water ice very close to the surface at, at quite a, a latitude range. Uh, and so that's uh, very appealing. It has these lava tubes you can run in uh, and out of. It has a, uh, a, a regolith composition. Um, regolith is a word I had to learn when I came to NASA. We call it soil on Earth, but there's nothing organic right this, on the moon, and so it's regolith. Uh, and so uh, Mars's regolith has properties uh, that enable us, uh, frankly, to be able to make bricks, uh, to be able to build shelters. And so automated manufacturing processes are one of the things that we're looking at uh, as well. But Mars is a more appealing uh, environment, uh, and so a lot of folks, that's why the, the Mars Direct folks are, are uh, making a strong push for that, uh, that pathway. The moon is, uh, the, 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 the other folks will say, look, you can learn so much by being on the moon and having a presence there. Uh, yeah, that's true. But if you think about the biggest impediments to Mars, it's the radiation environment, radiation protection, the moon can help you there, and it's entry, descent, and landing, and ascent through the Martian atmosphere. The moon can't help you there. And, and so um, we're thinking how much benefit really is there to being on the moon? Mm, so the debate continues. Other, uh, other thoughts and questions? Yes. Can you uh, grow food on Mars? Uh, in other words, like in a, some kind of a dome or, or something like that? We, th we, think, that we think that's possible. We, we, uh, uh, we want to do, of course, much more detailed looks at the, uh, uh, at the Martian surface, the Martian soil composition, and so that's why we continue to send landers and rovers to the Martian surface to really investigate uh, those possibilities. But we think that's, we think that's possible. Uh, How long are you thinking of having people on Mars? Good question. So there's, there's, a, there's a short stay solution and a long stay solution. All right. So uh, Mars and Earth are in their closest conjunction every 26 months. That's why we tend to fly missions to Mars, robotic missions on 26-month centers. Uh, uh, if you go to Mars and you want to do a long stay, you've got to be prepared for that length of time. Uh, if you want to go to Mars and back in the same, in the same trip and have a, uh, as much as you know, like a three-week stay, you could do that. But so then you have to ask yourself, what's the benefit? What, what, uh, operationally. And so we, we will be looking f probably at both short and long stay capabilities. Maybe the first trip is a short stay, uh, uh, focused on pre and placing capabilities for future missions, and then moving to long stay. Yeah. Can you give an idea of the, the number of people that are working on this effort, both Mars uh, and Earth? And where are 
are they? Universities, government, private, I mean, we're talking like 50,000 people, 100,000 people. How many people? Where are they? Where are they? Well, as far as, far as the, uh, the where they are, they're in all those places. Uh, in NASA, they are at Johnson Space Center, they're at Langley Space Center in Virginia, they're at Ames Research Center in California, they're at JPL. Um, uh, within the universities, they're all across the country. Um, there are probably, um, if I had to pick a round number, I'd say um, between NASA and universities, probably on the order of, of 10 to 20,000. So the agency, so let me think, the agency has 17,000 civil servants. About half of those are involved in human space flight. So there's, uh, there's eight or so. Um, and there's probably a greater number, 10 to 12,000 uh, in academia who are working on research grants from NASA on various aspects of the problem. Uh, private sector is hard to tell. It's growing so fast, uh, uh, it's really difficult to say. But I would probably guess there may be uh, maybe, um, gosh, that's, real, that's a really tough one. Um, so I think 50,000 all total is probably not a bad number, or not a bad estimate across uh, NASA, academia, and private industry. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm in cybersecurity. Oh, great. And my question is, uh, how big a target is the space program to uh, any kind of uh, terrorist? Huge. It's a huge target. Uh, uh, and it's, it's a huge target because it's, a, it's, a, it's, a politi it's politically visible, right? Uh, and so we get, uh, we get cyber attacks against agency assets uh, all the time. And we have, uh, as you can imagine, we have a, a, a cyber security, uh, a growing cyber security uh, presence, uh, capability to try and defend against those. Uh, the NASA CIO, uh, current ones, your information officer was hired in specifically uh, to address that issue. Uh, but we get, we get a, a tax all the time, uh, foreign and domestic. You know, foreign, it's like the, you know, the, the, the gee whiz uh, hacker that spends too much time in their parents' basement and they want to see what they can get away with. Uh, overseas, you've got you know, nefarious po folks uh, with their own agendas. Uh, so it's a, it's a big deal. And it's a drain on agency resources, frankly, that are, as it is for any organization. Uh, uh, and so people like you are worth your weight in gold. So if, you got, if you're bored, uh, come work at a space program. <laughs> okay. Well, you. okay. Yes? How about China and Russia and India? Uh, what are they doing? <gasps> yeah, yeah. So the, Russia maintains a, an active program. Uh, they, of course, have had significant budget uh, problems of their own, but they still fly. They're still active in the space station program. We still fly on their vehicles with our, uh, with our astronauts. Very capable. Uh, uh, but are, uh, are not yet ready to take a lead position in something. They want to just be, be part of So they actually just signed, there was the news this week where they signed an agreement with China to do uh, uh, a potential human and robotic joint uh, program. China has been accelerating their capability in space. Um, the problem with China is that we, by law, we, NASA, are by law forbidden to have bilateral relationships with Chinese space agencies because of China's behavior in the past. The Congress passed a law. And so the only time we could talk to the Chinese is in international forums. Uh, meanwhile, they could talk to the Russians, they could talk to whoever they want. And it's, uh, it's an awkward situation, but, it's, uh, um, but that's the way it is. But they're, they're increasingly capable. Uh, they've got, that's great. They flew the first uh, robotic lander to the, to the far side of the moon, uh, uh, which was quite a great accomplishment for them. India is up and coming. Uh, they're very active. Uh, they, of course, have tremendous challenges in their country for, uh, on their government's uh, resources. And so, uh, but, but what they have chosen to invest in space, they have uh, invested very judiciously, and we are actively engaged with uh, Indians in both, the, mostly in the robotic exploration at this point, but eventually want to bring them into the human program as well. We're actually working very hard with them to fly what we've wanted to fly in NASA for 25 years, which is a, a, a synthetic aperture radar. Um, we flew one on the, in, the bay, in the shuttle bay, got great data out of it. We'd love to have one operating all the time in India, and, uh, and we are going are gonna to do that. Uh, here in the next two years, it'll, it'll fly. Ah. Anything else I can answer for you? Any, any thoughts about how, I mean, does, does space exploration come up in your conversation around the dinner table or, or when you're watching TV or surfing the internet? Or has it, do, you, do you see it having an impact in your 
life is a, is a part of your aspiration for humanity in the future? Uh, where are you on, on all this? Well, this is for me. It doesn't come up around the dinner table, but I'm one of these nerdy people that friended the Curiosity Robot on Facebook. Oh, good for you. I was really excited to find out what happened um, with the, the spy crane maneuver. Yes. Uh, that one, I was one of these crazy people that set my alarm in the wee hours, and I got up to find out what happened. I was a, when I discovered it had been successful, this amazing, amazing maneuver. Or was it the, the 13 seconds of hell? Yep. <laughs> um, I was dancing around in my bedroom, my pajamas, that's really important because it worked. Yeah. It was, it was pretty cool. I was in the auditorium in NASA headquarters. We were doing the same thing. We were all in our pajamas or whatever, watching on the screen just to, to get the first signal that came back that was successful. And it's so, it's so frustrating because it happens minutes before you receive the signal. And so <laughs> you don't know, did it work or not? <laughs> until, until you get the signal. But yeah, it was a, it was a great day for... Uh, yeah, that's a SpaceX development. Yes, that, again, those, the private sector is becoming increasingly capable of the things that they feel like are in their market interest. And uh, uh, what's interesting about the commercial guys is that, that um, uh, there, there's, the, there's the commercial guys that want to make money, and then there's the commercial guys who are just really bored, really rich people. Uh, and are willing to throw money at something uh, because they have a vision for, uh, uh, Elon Musk is one of these characters who believes Humanity must become a multi-planet species if we're going to survive. Uh, uh, and there are other, and he's not alone in that. There are other people who, uh, who think that. Um, and he's willing to put his own money into it. Uh, and so there's that phenomenon as, uh, as well. But the commercial guys are becoming increasingly capable, uh, and we work with them a, a, a lot. They, it's a nice symbiotic relationship because we have capabilities that they need and to learn from, and they have uh, money to spend and capabilities that are growing on their side as well, like this uh, landing on a on a platform in the ocean, which is, uh, which is really cool. All right, thanks. Oh, so thank you, Greg.